want to take a moment to provide an overview of the recent NACA Indigenous Prosperity Conference. This is my first conference with NACA and it won't be my last. Shira Baberstock told me that this was an important conference for me to attend, and she was right. Shira is President and CEO of Oguajo Equal Source, an Indigenous social purpose enterprise on a mission to feel social impact through human-centered design, innovation, and Indigenous-led research. I'm really glad that she led me toward NACA. Before leaving, both Shira and Barry Payne, another amazing Indigenous advisor for Equal, as well as a serial entrepreneur and connector, made so many introductions that I felt at home as soon as I entered the conference. NACA was the first acronym among many that I came to learn during the two and a half day conference. It stands for National Aboriginal Capital Corporations Association. And it's the umbrella organization for a network of over 50 AFIs. And that stands for Aboriginal Finance Institutions. The AFI network has provided 50,000 loans totaling $3 billion to businesses owned by First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. NACA supports the network by building AFI capacity and fostering Indigenous business development. NACA's goal is to provide opportunities for Indigenous entrepreneurs and increase prosperity for Indigenous peoples in Canada. These efforts increase social and economic self-reliance and sustainability for Indigenous people and communities nationwide. Their vision is clear, promoting thriving, prosperous Aboriginal businesses with equitable access to capital and care. My goals in attending the forum were to listen, to learn, and to invite the Indigenous community into EQUO as founders, investors, capital providers, and partners. Finding meaningful ways to work together and to contribute to the strength of Canada and the world with rural and urban Indigenous communities is one of our goals at EQUO. Now, I'm not Indigenous, but I was made to feel part of their community and welcomed warmly by everyone that I met. While the conference was about Indigenous prosperity and empowerment, the themes, topics, and stories were relatable for every entrepreneur. Shannon, Meta Tawaban is the CEO of NACA, and in spite of running the conference, he managed to spend some time with me, which I really did appreciate. Shannon's a real leader who's family-oriented and community-oriented, which was very apparent uh, to me right from the start. His closing statement at the conference uh, is where he spoke about the need for the Indigenous community to gain economic prosperity through entrepreneurship equity, ownership in the businesses that are being built across Indigenous communities, and the need to come together to achieve self-reliance and economic growth that can benefit future generations. And this is happening. 1.67 million people in Canada are Indigenous, representing 5% of our entire population. Indigenous peoples are creating businesses at nine times the rate the average Canadian with more than 50,000 Indigenous owned businesses operating in Canada contributing over $31 billion to our economy. This is increasing as Indigenous also represent the youngest and fastest growing demographic in Canada. And it's a demographic that lives and breathes entrepreneurship. This shouldn't be surprising because I was reminded at the conference that the Indigenous were the first entrepreneurs in Canada long before any form of settlement from Europeans ever occurred. This conference was a real education for me. Sunshine Tenasco and Andre Jette hosted two and a half days with humor, insight, and a real sense of timing. Andre, I'm looking at you uh, with this point in particular. Andre wouldn't let a minute go to waste as they hosted a packed agenda. I should point out that Sunshine is the founder and CEO of Pow Wow Pitch. So think Dragon's Den, but focus on showcasing Indigenous entrepreneurs. Andre worked for the federal government, then became an entrepreneur, and he's currently working with NACA as an IT and facilities manager. The conference started with an address from Michael Hofford, President and CEO of Farm Credit Canada, an organization that only supports the agri-food business, and that just happens to be an industry contributing $142.7 billion annually to our GDP. And it's responsible for one in eight jobs. 
FCC is heavily involved with First Nations and was the principal sponsor for the forum. Adam Pfizer, Associate Director for the Conference Board, then presented AFI impacts. I learned that Aboriginal financial institutions, not only have they provided the $3 billion to support economic development to those 50,000 Indigenous businesses, but 50% of AFI direct investments went directly into retail, trade, agriculture, forestry and fishing, and accommodation and food services specifically. 46% went towards on-reserve businesses and 54 went towards off-reserve. When we discussed entrepreneurship, a typical white Western approach is focused almost entirely on money, valuations, investments, exit potential. At Equo, we believe that this is very much wrong as you know. Uh, and I learned very quickly that the value of founders in Indigenous society represents much more. And in fact, we share very much in common a more communal and a broader sense of success. When founders are supported not just through money, but via the larger community and the capital ecosystem, you're creating a much broader impact on self-determination, self-esteem, decreasing food scarcity, economic depression, and providing financial sovereignty that impacts entire communities. So this is critical given that the conference board showcased how remote First Nations, especially those communities that are even further out, they've got lower education scores, high unemployment rates, and unacceptably high rates of unsuitable and inadequate housing. However, for those communities with strong AFIs, you've got very high education rates, high income rates, low levels of unsuitable and inadequate housing. In fact, for every $1 in AFI lending, it produced $3.60 in total GDP, with near-perfect repayment rates in most communities. Frank Bush, founder and CEO of Nation Fund, moderated the next panel with Allison Nankovell, Senior VP Fund Investments and Global Scaling for BDC, Frank Richter, Managing Director, Indigenous Growth Fund, Geraldine Marshall, Director of Finance of New Chat North, forgive me if I got that pronunciation uh, wrong, Economic Development Corporation, as well as Shannon, again, CEO of NACA. They discussed the introduction of the Indigenous Growth Fund, which is the newest and largest Indigenous investment fund with $150 million. The initial investment is coming from the Government of Canada, BDC, Farm Credit Canada, and Export Development Canada. Now, what makes us different is that this is an evergreen fund, allowing the First Nations to buy back ownership in the fund as repayments occur. This allows a perpetually growing fund to be reinvested back into other founders to keep growing an ecosystem that can benefit the communities where those investments are being made. Though there were many incredible panels and conversations, it was the next panel had the largest impact on me personally. The topic was breaking barriers, empowering Indigenous women in business. Sunshine Tenasco, founder of Powa Pitch, moderated the discussion with Helen Babawash, FCPA, Magnolia Perrin, Indigenous Women's Entrepreneurship Team Lead for NACA, Shannon Pestin, co-founder of Finance Cafe, and Victoria Gagne, business development specialist from the Clarence Campo Development Fund. Now, I'm going to spend a bit more time on this topic because it deserves more time. The conversation was honest, open, very transparent, and it was also very moving. Central to the topic was that more Indigenous women need to be equipped to feel like entrepreneurship is an option for them. Women simply have more responsibilities to the community and to the family. There isn't gender equality when a mother is preparing breakfast for the family, getting the kids ready for school, showering, getting dressed before they, they can even walk out the door. So as the panel joked, the man, they simply get dressed and they walk out the door. So when women become business owners, they change more than their own family. They're becoming role models for other women and young girls in the community who can look at them and see the potential of what they can do in their future. Becoming your own boss means taking control of your own life. It also means increasing your financial well being, self esteem, self determination while creating employment and reducing food scarcity in the community. There's a strong desire for female entrepreneurs, especially Indigenous women. 
for financial sovereignty. But there's also a harsh reality for these potential female entrepreneurs. There is intergenerational trauma associated with violence for the majority of Indigenous women. This is an important point because it isn't just the trauma that individual women carry, but also the traumas that their family members might also be experiencing as well. And all of this is related to colonialism and racism. Violence happens from institutions with people that women know, but it's also a large part of people that women don't know. So this past week was Red Dress Day, acknowledging missing and murdered Indigenous women. It's simply unacceptable in every way and deeply disturbing when you begin to realize the scope of this violence. And yes, this is something that all women face too often, but Indigenous women face far more violence and systemic racism. Statistics Canada released a report in May of 2021 on intimate partner violence of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit women. And the report indicated that 61% of Indigenous women in Canada experience intimate partner violence. And a study that came out from the U.S., from the National Institute for Justice, where they reported 84% of American Indian women and Alaskan Native women experience violence at some point in their life. This means that safety becomes a concern when you're trying to build a business and inevitably dealing with men. You need to accommodate and acknowledge the circumstances of these women and not only their family life with children, but ensuring that they can grow and be mentored from a business standpoint in a safe place. So beyond this point, there were also conflicts in Western entrepreneurship versus Indigenous entrepreneurship as well, because money holds so much more meaning and power, which doesn't always feel right for Indigenous, who value a broader sense of success through community and other measurements that include financial sovereignty, as well as self-determination and autonomy. So money is power and violence is power. And so the lateral violence women face is something that needs to come out and be understood. We need to shift the behavior and change measurements of success to not only heal, but elevate one another and especially women. And non-Indigenous need to understand that Indigenous entrepreneurs are aware that often they're selling their community, they're selling their culture. So they want to ensure that they aren't making money off of something that they shouldn't be. There's a responsibility to their community. So they don't want to advance themselves in a way that socially or economically hurts the communities or future generations. There's a much greater sense of we than me. There's also a reality for Indigenous women who often lack financial literacy and who haven't come from wealth and they're not comfortable walking to a bank or asking for money. So the outcome of all of these things when you add them up all of the surrounding individuals that these women come into contact with is when they are trying to push themselves forward from a business standpoint, is that they are often undervaluing themselves and allowing a situation where they can be taken advantage of further in spite of the fact that this shouldn't be happening to begin with. So the importance of acknowledging these women and their needs is critical, but acknowledging their capacity is something that can truly benefit themselves, their family, their community, and Canada as a whole. These women need access to capital, access to knowledge on operational skills, access to markets, and to be acknowledged for the broad impact that they have in society, and not just Indigenous society, all of society. So I want to share a report uh, that I pulled up that demonstrates this, and it's the Women's Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub on Breaking Barriers. It's a decade of Indigenous women's entrepreneurship in Canada. So Indigenous women make up 40% of self-employed Indigenous people, while all self-employed non-Indigenous women in Canada make up 36%. While the majority of Indigenous women-owned businesses are sole proprietors, so 60%, the percentage with employees other than themselves has nearly doubled in the last decade up from 23% in 2010 to 42% in 2019. That's incredible. Now, the proportion of Indigenous women-owned business respondents with revenue greater than $1 million has doubled in recent years. This is from 4% in 2015 to 9% in 2019. The proportion of Indigenous women-owned businesses that are incorporated has also increased over time. 
from 17% in 2010 to 21% in 2019. So imagine what can happen when we all start supporting these women. So what can we do to help, especially if you're non-Indigenous? Well, here's something interesting. And this was brought to light by Barry Payne. If 5% of Canadian businesses shifted procurement contracts to Indigenous businesses, that would translate to $23.6 billion influx into the Indigenous economy. So I'm going to ask you to reach out and start to look at buying directly from Indigenous-owned businesses for not only your own household needs, but other procurement practices. And you can also look to provide mentorship and additional capital for these businesses. Okay, so the next panel was Innovations in Indigenous Financing. Now, the moderator was again Shannon Meta Tawaban, CEO of NACA. Joining him was Bobby Alualia, partner, Courage Capital, Don Metahabe Leach, chair of the National Indigenous Economic Development Board, Jean Vincent, CEO, Aboriginal Savings Corporation of Canada, Karen Kastner, VP Partnerships and Government Relations, BDC, and Keith Martell. CEO of the First Nations Bank of Canada. The theme was how to increase access to capital, which is a topic that every entrepreneur can certainly relate to. But because of circumstances for Indigenous entrepreneurs, capital can be even harder to find. And now this includes the existence of the Indian Act and the remoteness of communities, as well as the inherent bias and racism where Indigenous entrepreneurs are perceived to be higher risk. The conversation, even though it's about capital, it's really about financial sovereignty, data sovereignty, and protecting the future. The goal is to have First Nations to have the ability to own equity and finance themselves. What's happening is that key lenders, including the various lenders taking part of the panel, have been working with NACA and AFIs to be able to shift the capital landscape and to really encourage private equity to increasingly participate in the Indigenous ecosystem. How this has evolved is through much hard work to increase the National Indigenous Economic Strategy led and developed for the first time by Indigenous people. This includes four core strategic pathways, people, land, infrastructure, and finance. There are 137 calls to economic prosperity, and the strategy for this is going to be released June 6th in Ottawa. The core takeaway for me was that Indigenous should no longer accept minority stakes or royalties from non-Indigenous businesses who use Indigenous resources to build profitable companies. Indigenous can and should own equity and build these businesses themselves. The reality is that Indigenous have shown a better success rate in program delivery than non-Indigenous because no one understands the needs of Indigenous communities better than First Nations. The panel indicated that they can do a better job delivering infrastructure programming, administering their own education, opening doors to contracting and procurement opportunities, working with their own clients and managing a national and indigenous business directory. And it goes without saying that they can manage their own citizenship. The impact of this was shown as recently with Clearwater, as well as many, many smaller projects where indigenous control and management is showing not only promise, but profitability and results. Of note, housing was something addressed, given that founders often rely on equity in their homes to build their businesses. But there's a huge disparity in equity available for non-Indigenous versus Indigenous when it comes down to home ownership. Creating more home ownership not only improves housing, but stimulates entrepreneurship and overall wealth especially in the early days when you're building a business and you're relying on your own savings or equity in your own home because you can't find the capital that you need. This was a great panel and I really strongly encourage everyone to reach out to NACA to discuss the various new forms of capital and new ways to convert capital. Uh, I simply can't uh, go through enough of that in this particular conversation, but there is a clear shift in the issuance of bonds and other types of capital that can turn into equity through various forms and different vehicles. Additionally, a discussion also pointed out the loan and capital sizes are being increased to allow for larger businesses to get the capital that they need to grow. Historically, there's been much smaller loan amounts, which obviously impacts 
the speed and the size of the opportunity that entrepreneurs can take on. The next session was a breakout session, and I chose Pandemic to Prosperity. Mark Dokus, special project for NACA, was host with Jake Sinclair, Entrepreneur of Anytime Fitness, Kevin Eshkogogan, CEO, Indigenous Tourism Ontario, and Monica Brunet, Manager of Economic Development and Community Engagement for the Sask Metmetee Economic Development Corporation. What struck me most in the session was not the resilience of the various businesses, but the recognition that the future of Indigenous business and tourism was strong. And everyone is very focused with optimism toward growth. Now, this session was cut short for me as I had a wonderful opportunity to meet with Shannon directly to discuss EQUA. Really appreciated my time with him and look forward to future conversations and how we can collaborate with Indigenous founders, investors, and capital providers to strengthen our ecosystem, create a truly inclusive environment that welcomes urban and rural Indigenous entrepreneurs into the community we're building. So if you're watching this video and like to learn more, please go to equoshift.com and reach out to me directly on how you can basically become part of Equo. And there's a lot of ways that you can play an incredible part in what we're building. Our goal is to create an inclusive platform to help founders of all races, genders, ages, and geographies to find the investors, capital funding, and customers that they need to grow. But I wanna get back to the conference, which, it extended into Thursday, May 5th, which was also Red Dress Day. A recognition of the missing and murdered Indigenous women. And in honor of this day, red dresses were placed inside the conference, on the stage, and throughout the forest outside to honor those women. So we would never forget. And to remind us that we need to change the racism, violence, and harm that's being perpetuated toward Indigenous women. So after this recognition, Jim Bennett from the AltaChip Limited Corporation moderated a session with David Kobliski, Manager Nelson House Development Corporation, Sandy Wong, General Manager of the Telautix Aboriginal Capital Company, and Lee Shorter, I think I didn't fully get his last name, so apologies, Lee, who's the District Board Advisor for the Arctic Cooperatives Limited. The subject was achieving self-reliance through economic growth, exploring Indigenous community-owned business. So this particular session left a real impression with me, especially given that we have a similar mindset in terms of how we're building Equal as a community-owned for-profit company with a social enterprise and impact mentality. The conversation really helped me to think uh, even more uh, about how we can continue to reframe Equal and to understand how we're structuring Equal and how we are incorporating individuals, as well as determining how we make decisions that are more community focused. The conversation centered around how indigenous communities can create companies that are owned by the community so that resources and profits can be reinvested back into the community and help with the growth of those communities for generations to come. One example, was the Alta Chip Corporation, which was formed to acquire the assets of a pulp chip operation in Beaver Cove in Northern Vancouver Island. So Alta Chip is owned by Alta Resources, which is 100% owned by the Unkies First Nation. This was a great example of how the community took control of a waste byproduct, leftover lumber that was simply left to either rot or burn. And it was developed into a company that used that waste to create wood chips that could be sold to benefit the community and the environment, given how damaging that burnoff was to the local community as well as the environment via greenhouse gases. Notion was to gain capital to form the company and shift that capital into equity that went into ownership on behalf of that company. So they first had to do this by de-risking the project by finding long-term buyers for the pulp. So it was easier to go to the banks and other capital providers. So after gaining the initial capital, they then sold the minority interest back to the buyers, ensuring that they had continued involvement in the company and bringing the logging company that was providing the initial wood chips in as well. And that helped ensure supply. This allowed the company to be majority controlled by the First Nation and created a sustainable partnership that benefited all partners. Now, addressing the equity situation 
it ensures that the resources of the community can be profited by that community. This required a shift in how indigenous seek capital, structure businesses, and involve the community. And the outcome has been greater resources, greater capital, and learning, which again goes back into the community and creates even more opportunities. Really loved the approaches that were discussed in this panel. I encourage anyone to reach out to NACA also to learn more. There were other incredible stories shared, but in the interest of time, I'm going to stop here. So there were two more addresses that followed from the Deputy Governor, Bank of Canada, Lawrence Shembri, and the Honourable Patty Hadju, Minister of Indigenous Services. There certainly seemed to be a strong movement toward improving how government was evolved in First Nations, which is great. One question, though, that struck me is a very valid question. Why isn't there any Indigenous representation at the Bank of Canada? So I know that we began adding representation and equal from various communities. And we really focused on black and indigenous representation as well as women entrepreneurs, given the lack of perspective and involvement of these groups in particular historically. So I, I really think a good solid first step here would be doing this in the Bank of Canada as well. So I'm going to leave that at that, but uh, I think it was a very valid question, and I think it's an easy next step to rectify. The next session, which is the last session before the closing of the conference, was on Indigenous youth, investing in the next generation of entrepreneurs. Holly Achjekute, again, forgive me for the pronunciation, from Futurepreneur Canada spoke with Angie Zachary, founder of the BUT Bar, Destiny Peter, founder of Tangles Hair and Beauty, and 11-year-old Maya Bowdry, founder of Kokum Scrunchies. The strength of these young entrepreneurs was inspiring. Like almost all entrepreneurs, taking a first step as a founder is scary. For young Indigenous founders, getting access to capital can be not only very difficult, but gaining the simple knowledge on how to start the company and what to do can be very frustrating, given the lack of mentors, advisors, and people that they're able to turn to. So each of these founders relied on family and community where they were able, but much of the way for each of them was paved simply by pushing forward, making mistakes, and staying true to the vision that they had and the belief in themselves. They each talked though about a debt that they owed to their community and the pride that they shared having been successful and building a team that could help support their business. They began with little guidance and evolved into role models for the communities who now act as a future generation of advisors for all upcoming founders, which is really important. What was very apparent was the fact that the banking capital system doesn't support Indigenous founders. Uh, each of them has relied on the First Nations to make their dreams possible. And in fact, there was a lot of conversation about reaching out to Canadian banks and having absolutely no support until they started to actually show real gains, at which time they started to open up their doors. Well, I've experienced this too, and I think every entrepreneur in Canada has experienced this. So I'm also going to put a challenge out to the Canadian banks on behalf of founders. We all see this, and we need to change this. We need more access to capital or we will be turning to alternative capital providers. So this is what these young women have done. And this is really an impact. The fact that there are at least other alternative, First Nations Bank, other opportunities for capital for these young women. And that was a large part of the impact in the conversation because they were able to get access to some of these things. And because they also sacrificed and used their own life savings. They were able to grow incredible companies. So I think we can all acknowledge when we support young founders, we're supporting future founders too. Each of these businesses become beacons of success, allowing these young women to not only take control of their lives and their futures, but they're giving back to the community in so many different ways. So it was a great way to end the panels for the conference. Uh, and we then moved on to Shannon Meta Tawaban, CEO of NACA, who closed the forum with a powerful set of remarks. 
First Nations are on a journey for financial security, data autonomy, and a recognition that their land and the resources on that land belong to Indigenous people. He emphasized that First Nations are the original entrepreneurs long before Canada was created that Indigenous want to work hard and build businesses that can benefit all First Nations communities across Canada. He spoke about the time having come to be self-reliant and self-determined. He also noted that there are many people who have and will try to take advantage of First Nations, that they must be aware of these people, but that there are also allies who are non-Indigenous who should be welcomed into and throughout their journey was very aware of those remarks, given why I was attending. And I hope that I'm seen as an ally and that Equal can be a community that is seen to welcome all First Nations in our platform. Shannon particularly focused on the need for collaboration, listening, and acting with purpose to create an ecosystem that allows First Nations entrepreneurs to have access to knowledge, capital, and other resources that they need to succeed. He made it apparent that the First Nations are in control of their future that they're able and prepared to make a future a strong and profitable one for all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. So for my closing note, I found that the forum to be transformative and a reminder that all founders face incredible barriers, but some more than others. By including everyone and working hard together through collaboration, support, and mutual guidance, we can reduce those barriers. So thank you very much. I hope this recap was useful. Miigwech.